You've seen the stories of squatters who take over properties with fake leases, and then the owners have a terrible time trying to get these people out. I'm Kathy Fetke, and welcome to The Real Well Show. You're listening to The Real Well Show with Kathy Fetke, the real estate investor's resource. Today, we're going to talk about how you can protect yourself from squatters and also from title fraud. Our guest today is George McCleary. He's a real estate investor and social media personality who actually gained viral fame by exposing how effortlessly a house could be stolen. But he also came up with systems to help property owners avoid this kind of pain. And he's going to share that with us today on The Real Well Show. So George, welcome. Good to be here. Thanks so much, Kathy. Uh, This topic of squatting has been a hot topic for the last few months. It's probably just hit the news recently and been going on a lot longer than that. So is that true? Have we, are we seeing more squatting these days or is it just hitting the news now? A little bit of both. Um, So in recent years, recent months in particular, um, the word is out on squatting. And that's not just about cases where people have been uh, have fallen victim to the scam, but also squatters are getting more sophisticated. They're using different methods now that are a lot more powerful and insidious and allow them to occupy properties for that much longer and continue their scam. Oh, yes. So social media. (laughs) <laughs> yes. Yeah. A little bit of social media. I mean, that people trade good information there and they also trade bad information there. Yeah. I know there was the famous, I guess, TikToker who was teaching all kinds of people how to, how to do this. So he actually, uh, he's in prison now the, uh, oh. the guy from, uh, oh gosh, where was he from Honduras or something? Yeah. They, they, they finally tracked him down. Oh, okay. American prisoner. <laughs> um, you know, I think he was in America. So, okay. and that's what he was doing. He was, uh, he was, um, squatting. And so, um, most squatters go unpunished, but if you get really saucy about it and start spouting off about it on social media, then yeah, he starts to, uh, <laughs> starts to fly a little above the radar. There, there might be consequences. Tell me your origin story. How did you become, um, kind of the squatter defender? So what happened was, so I'm a 20 year real estate veteran as a broker, a developer, house flipper, uh, built apartments, luxury homes, everything across the board and uh, doing business in Portland. um, You've got a lot of uh, constraints in landlord tenant country and a lot of laws. It's a very liberal jurisdiction. And so some of my friends, including myself, had fallen fallen victim um, in some way or another to a squatter scam. And so I took to social media and I said, all right, here's how they're doing it. And I basically uh, laid out the ease with which squatters are occupying properties here in Portland. And it completely exploded. It got tens of millions of views across all the platforms. Um, I went on cable news shows, Dr. Phil, um, a whole bunch of news outlets um, were calling me up. And so uh, over the course of time, I started talking to people who had contacted me who had also been victims of squatter and title fraud scams. And I started noticing a lot of patterns. I started interviewing them on Zoom and just slowly but surely over several months, got to be um, pretty much the only expert in this space uh, that really understands exactly what's at work here and how to fix it. Yeah, let's start there. How how are people getting away with squatting and why why can't they just be kicked out? So here's the deal. Um, So let's first draw a distinction between um, a holdover tenant, which is a tenant that's just, you know, not paying and a squatter. A squatter is somebody that's trespassing into a property and willfully trespassing and breaking the law. But here's the thing. They're pretending that they have the right to be there. So they move in their stuff. They move in their friends and they make the appearance to law enforcement with um, all their stuff, plus a fake lease utilities in their name, that they have the legitimate right to be there. And so they essentially just fool them. So when the cops come to the door and says, hey, like, who are you? What are you doing here? This guy says you're not allowed to be here. They say, well, I have a lease. As you can see, I have the right to be here. And they, the, the cop at that point is not going to put his job on the line to remove somebody out of their house because removing somebody out of their house is a big deal. You can't just do that unless you've got a very good reason and to believe that they're committing a crime. And so what you've got here is a he said, she said. And so they're not mm-hmm. going to put their job on the line, no matter if it's a red state or a blue state. They don't either know either person from Adam. So they say, all right, you two go sort it out in court. And then the court process gets protracted. They do uh, uh, continuances. They switch lawyers and they just delay the process and occupy the place in the process. 
the tenant is able to delay the process. That would be the squatter. The squatter. Uh, so <laughs> They're the not a tenant. <laughs> tenants can do that as well. But um, in this case, it's a lot more insidious because the uh, squatters never had the right to be there in the first place. And they're just full-blown trespassers, but they're, they're getting away with a fiction. And then they then uh, the homeowner tries to evict them using that process and and uh, basically making them a tenant in the process by oh. giving them the rights. And so they're going through the same process that you would to evict a tenant, even though they're not. So what I'm hearing is that's not the way to do it. Well, sometimes it's the best choice, but rarely is, rarely is it ever. People do that because it's quicker than ejectment. But then in the squatter defender training series, I teach you all the different methods and all the little uh, nuances to it because every situation is very, uh, is very different. You never know what uh, the best avenue is, but sometimes eviction actually is the best way to go, but rarely though. And the other thing you said is ejection. Well, there's ejectment, but then there's also other methods as well. There's also a lot of things that you don't want to do, like um, uh, pulling a gun on your squatters, uh, violent altercations. Um, a lot of the cases that I studied included um, cases where uh, the homeowner had been hurt or sometimes even killed by the squatter. And that's why these laws are in place to prevent these uh, violent altercations. But uh, the best thing you can do is uh, it's kind of a gray area. Uh, remember I was talking before about how it's easy to take someone out of a house. It's pretty easy to put someone in a house. And so uh, there's a method that's getting popular lately and there's contractors, I got people all over the country that, that are doing it and it's squatting on the squatter. It's where you hire a group of contractors that goes and moves in with your blessing with the squatters. It, they, you sign a lease with them and they become roommates. And as you might imagine, the people that are squatting on the squatter are not the best roommates and they make their <laughs> life uh, uh, very difficult. And at that point, the squatter has a choice to make. You know, the jig is up and a lot of them just, you know, immediately, immediately leave because you don't have a hapless victim that's just going to go through the courts and not have, you know, any backbone to it. Or you've got somebody that's actually standing up for themselves and, you know, hiring some muscle to get them the heck out of there. Well, that's, you better get highly paid for that job to be <laughs> staying in the house. So then they actually stay in the house. Yeah. Yeah. They, so the, they are high, highly paid individuals because, you know, they are putting themselves in danger. Yeah, and again, each risk. situation is, is different because most of the time squatters are just people that just want something free and they've heard that they can get away with it, get away with the theft uh, without facing the consequences. But as soon as they're really met with some resistance, you know, a lot of times they give it up, but then you've got other people that are a lot more desperate and violent and terrible. And so, yeah, so the removal service does, you know, cost a chunk of change, but when you compare it to a month's long occupation and complete trashing of your place, paying a lawyer, paying court, court costs, uh, there's no, there's no easy, cheap way out of it. This is un the unfortunate reality. Well, how do you, how do you avoid having squatters to begin with? So that just never happens. That's... <laughs> Good That's question. A big question. The quickest and easiest thing that you can do to uh, keep people away from your property. First of all, uh, if you have a vacant property, try and make it look like it's not vacant. There's a whole long list of things you can do to do that. But, you know, the, the, the low hanging fruit is just, uh, you know, sweep away cobwebs, you know, pick up packages on your doorstep. But if you're out of state, you know, you can't do that. So the most obvious thing, and this is very intuitive, but, um, most people ignore it because they think it's complicated or expensive is just a simple, a simple burglar alarm, but mm -hmm. not a big involved one with a whole bunch of wiring and professional install. We're talking about a simple base station, motion sensor and camera package. And in squatter defender, you get 50% off on that and you just install it and uninstall it just by hand. You just place it within the unit. And when you're done with it, when it gets rented, you put it in your other vacant unit and you just mm -hmm. hang on to it and move it into different places so that you're notified. And if you want to have the extra monitoring, it's like 25 bucks a month you have the cops show up, you can do that. But the most important part is, you know, who's coming and going from your place. And it's that simple. Yeah. Yeah, even a ring doorbell would be a, a, the minimum, right? Oh, yeah. No, a ring doorbell is good. So with all these things, you've got like cloud-based services that are like monthly fees and everything, and they mm -hmm. scare some people away. So, um, And then once a tenant moves in, of course, you got to you know give it to them. But whereas um, a simple camera and alarm system, you know, it's just you. It just goes to your phone, and it'll ping you if something's, if something's awry. 
What are some of the craziest squatter stories that you've heard? I mean, we've seen some just here and I'm in the Los Angeles area. There was the, the famous Beverly Hills or a Brent Wood situation, but Oh, that's yeah. right. You heard yeah. all about that, didn't you? Yeah, that was, that was a good one. That one was really crazy because sometimes they're real like low level kind of like street people, but then other times they're like white collar criminals that just kind of figure they can get away with this and they've got real jobs, they got families, but they just, they just perpetrate the scam because they can and they just don't really care. But to answer your question, uh, craziest story. Uh, the one that I like to talk about is the one with my friend Leica in Seattle. She had squatters oh, up in, up in her place. Oh, you know this one. I, yeah. Yes, but I haven't talked about it here on the show. So Leica is a friend of mine from Seattle and she owns a bunch of real estate up there. And she found out right before she was going on stage at Bigger Pockets that she had squatters in one of her Queen Anne units. That's a fancy neighborhood in Seattle. And so she, uh, at first the cop said, Hey, you know, sorry, can't remove them. Not going to do anything. So she had that worst case scenario. Uh, but luckily for her, she's kind of famous. She has a lot of, uh, uh she has a big following on social media. And so she took to the airwaves and said, Hey, you're not going to believe what's happening here. And that exerted a lot of pressure on the authorities to act. And then when they pulled them out, it was this big raid. There was, um, they set up like a DJ booth in there. There was stolen property. And then the coup de gras, they had a stripper pole installed in the living room. And she I mean, was, why wouldn't you? you know. I mean, wh why not? I mean, it's, it's a chicken in every pot and a stripper pole in every, in every living room, right? So, <laughs> so they eventually did get rid of them. But, um, but they, yeah, they, they copped to the whole thing saying like, oh, yeah, we just saw you were an out-of-state owner she was incorporated in Delaware. She's not out of state, but mm -hmm. yeah. So, but that story had a lot of wheels on account of like just how aggressive and egregious the strippers, the strippers, <laughs> the squatters were. And um, then the stripper pole as well, just gave it really uh, made it a whole lot funnier. But, but, but you're saying that had she not been an influencer, it would have been harder for her to get the police aligned on this. Oh, undoubtedly a hundred percent. What? Because they just, like you said, they, they don't, it's not their problem. Yeah, they came okay. and went and said, hey, sorry, but um, we can't help you on this. You've got to go through the courts. And it was only because of the pressure that came as a result of um, hundreds of thousands of people seeing her video and, and saying, hey, what the heck is going on here? And so it ended up being kind of like political pressure. And that wow. really rarely happens. The other 99% of cases are with people that are not famous and they, you know, go to the cops, the cops say no. And so what do they do next? They call their lawyer and their lawyer says, uh, gee, um, I guess, uh, we got to evict these people. <laughs> and so she still lost uh, about a hundred thousand dollars on that oh. because the unit was so completely trashed. Oh my gosh. Poor thing. So, Cash for keys is, does that work where you just say, here's a chunk of money, just go. Uh, yeah, that's a tough one uh, because it, it brings me no joy to say this, but yes, cash for keys can be an option because mm -hmm. really like, what's the point here? You're supposed to, you're trying to get your place back, Yeah, but you're really kind of perpetuating the scam, aren't you? Right, right. It's, uh, you're encouraging money. It. Yeah, you're encouraging it. And so, but if you've got, you're staring down the barrel of months and months of having your place occupied and you know, nowhere else to turn. Your lawyers send you bills for thousands of dollars. And the guy says, Hey man, I'll leave. If you could just give me like, you know, 8k or something. I mean, that's a crazy price to pay, but it's either 8k and get them out of your place and go on with your life. Or it's going to be like another 40 on top for paying your lawyer and having your place go unrented and continue to get trashed. And so you kind of got to weigh these things. Do you want to keep fighting the good fight or do you want to just, you know, pony up the cash and, move on with your life. Wow. Um, but the reality is a lot of people, a lot of victims don't have um, eight grand to just, you know, reach into the coffers and pay these people. Most um, rentals are owned by mom and pop landlords that aren't mm -hmm. super duper wealthy. So it's not always an option. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about deed fraud, a different kind of fraud where not only have they faked a lease, but they've uh, tried to take title to your property. I'm assuming I had an Australian contact me probably 10 years ago and say, is this true? Do you have this deed fraud in the U S? And I said, I, I don't know. I've never, I've never seen that happen. They're like, Oh, we, we've heard it happens all the time. Now that was, like I said, 10 years ago in the past 10 years, I bet there's more and more people who have taught others how to do that as well. So is that an issue? 
Yes, yes. And it's a real growing issue. I'm surprised to hear about it um, from 10 years ago, because mm -hmm. uh, it's one of those things where it's been a crime that somebody could have committed like this entire time because uh, the security measures for filing a deed are still just like a signature and a rubber stamp. It's just mm. minimum. It's not like forging a hundred dollar bill, but it's one of those things where there was like 10,000 cases this year, last year, oh 6,000, and then 2,000, then 1,000 the year before. So it's gone from like, you know, being really minuscule to growing exponentially. Wow. Which is, which is crazy because these are the ship sinkers. These are the things that will ruin you as a real estate professional. Um, the damages in the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands or more. But the thing is that people don't talk about with uh, deed fraud and title fraud is that if you're a victim of it, there's a really good chance that you're not going to get your money back. That title insurance is not going to cover you because the standard um, Ulta owner's policy does not cover fraud and impersonation from the policy date forward. It's from the policy right, date in the past. In the past, yes, yeah. you know this. Mm -hmm. So um, there are policies that cover it, but you got to buy a brand new one if you don't have it. And it's, as you might imagine, it's not cheap. So instead of ponying up, you know, fifteen hundred bucks for a new policy, I sell software that monitors your title and alerts you if anything goes wrong, and that's just a few bucks a month. So lower cost alternative. Oh, very cool. Okay. Yeah. Um, and is this, are there certain areas where this is happening more? You said you're, did you say you're in Portland? Yeah. Portland, yeah. Oregon. Yeah. So Portland, West yeah, Coast here. to be the, uh, you know, the center of, of these of sort of anti-landlord type stuff, but, uh, where, where, yes. <laughs> where are the most popular places to commit these kinds of frauds? So it's mainly in bigger cities in more liberal jurisdictions where the criminals really just feel empowered uh, to do this stuff, uh, specifically with the squatting. You see this a little bit more, but uh, with the deed fraud, these are a little bit more sophisticated criminals and they're acting really everywhere mm -hmm. because in in most counties, the process by which a, a property title is recorded is pretty much the same everywhere. You know, you get the notary stamp, you've got a deed, it's just a simple piece of paper, and it can be forged very easily. And then as long as you've got a marketplace where you can actually resell a property uh, relatively quickly with like a wholesaler, um, and those are the people that are like the we buy ugly houses, and they can close really quickly. Those uh, those type of places are going to be your highest risk. If you're in the middle of nowhere, um, yeah, it's definitely possible, but um, maybe a little bit less likely because you know property in cities like uh, Portland or Los Angeles, if it's priced right, in general terms, it's going to sell pretty quickly. So that's where your highest risk is. But really, anywhere where there's a house or a property of any size that has any sort of equity in it, especially if it's very low debt, then it's a property that's at risk. Yikes. Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> thanks for scaring the bejeebers out of us, George. But <laughs> how, so people can find out about your course um, by going to our show notes. So knowing so much about, um, about these issues, has that deterred you from wanting to invest in real estate? You know, good question. Uh, and the answer is absolutely not. I am a born and bred, died in the wool real estate investor, and I'm never going to stop. But I tell you this, though, um, all this, what I've found out about with this whole experience of going viral and talking to victims of these crimes, it's just made me a whole lot more aware that there's stuff that can completely ruin you. And I really don't want that to happen. I've worked really hard to build up the business that I have to date. And mm -hmm. to think that somebody could just take it away just like that yeah. is pretty wild and people have kind of our, their sights set on people like you and me kathy it's a they're they figure okay well you know they're they're wealthy real estate people it doesn't really matter they're yeah, on their own they won't and, notice <laughs> <laughs> right and so we're so we're kind of we're kind of on our own to protect ourselves and so that's yeah. it's just made me a whole lot more cautious not full-blown paranoid but you know taking the taking the, the steps as soon as i finished that title fraud defender site i immediately put my entire portfolio and my parents house and my relatives house and everybody's all in there so if anything goes wrong i know about it and that makes me feel a little bit better at night yeah. Awesome. All right, George. Well, thank you for sharing this, these tips with us here on The Real Wealth Show. Awesome. Thanks so much, Kathy. And thank you for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. Offline, George told me, don't be too freaked out. This is something that is happening and is happening more and more. But hopefully, as more and more people understand how to protect themselves, it will happen less. And he's provided those systems. 
So again, I'm Kathy Fetke. Thanks so much for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. We'll see you next time. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any securities or to make or consider any investment or course of action. For more information, go to realwealthshow.com.